Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a great honor to have everybody here. And I know the press uh, was not quite expecting this, so I appreciate your being able to attend. We have uh, a terrific number of things and some very positive things to tell you tonight. I want to begin by giving an update on the economy. Economic health is vital to public health. That's why our strategy to kill the China virus is focused on protecting those at greatest risk, while allowing younger and healthy Americans to safely return to work and safely return to school, very important. We added 1.8 million new jobs in July, exceeding predictions for the third month in a row, and adding a total of over 9.3 million jobs since May. And I will say that the job growth that we've seen over the last three months, 9.3 million, is the single greatest three-month period of job creation in American history. That's big stuff. That's big news and great news. Over the past three months, the United States has surpassed market expectations by a total of 12 million new jobs. Over the last three months, the United States has added 623,000 manufacturing jobs. Remember, you'd need a magic wand to get manufacturing jobs. And we're getting them even in uh, a pandemic which is disappearing. It's going to disappear. And 639,000 brand new construction jobs. Over half of the new jobs are full time jobs, and wages are up by 4.8 percent, which is terrific. Unemployment has fallen by nearly 30 percent since April. Think of that 30 percent since April. Hispanic American unemployment has decreased by nearly 32 percent. Jobs held by African Americans, which were hit especially hard by the shutdowns, incredibly hard, increased by nearly one million over the past three months. And that's also a record. That's a job record. African American, one million, it's a job record. We must ensure that the progress continues. My administration has enacted over three trillion in historic relief since China allowed the virus to infect the world. So we've contributed $3 trillion. My administration continues to work in good faith to reach an agreement with Democrats in Congress that will extend unemployment benefits, provide protections against evictions. A terrible thing happens with evictions. Not fair. It wasn't their fault that we were infected with this disease from China and get relief to American families. Yet, tragically, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer continue to insist on radical left-wing policies that have nothing to do with the China virus, nothing to do with it at all. So you have a virus that comes in, and you have people in Congress that don't want to help our people. If Democrats continue to hold this critical relief hostage, I will act under my authority as President to get Americans the relief they need. And what we're talking about is deferring the payroll tax for a period of months till the end of the year, and I can extend it at a certain period. Hopefully, I will be here to uh, do the job. We're going to do the job. We've been doing a job like nobody could. Nobody would, actually. And so we're going to have the payroll tax go till the end of the year, and it'll be retroactive to July 1st. So we're going to go back to July 1st, and it'll go to the end of the year, payroll tax. At the end of the year, it may be extended. We're going to enhance unemployment benefits through the end of the year. So unemployment benefits will be — that's a big one will be uh, brought out to the end of the year and defer student loan payments and forgive interest until further notice. So students who are paying student loans, and in many cases, they're not even allowed to go back into their colleges. 
extend the eviction moratorium. We will be extending that so people aren't evicted. Not their fault. We had a lengthy discussion this morning with President Macron of France concerning numerous subjects, but in particular, the catastrophic event which took place in Beirut, Lebanon. Horrible, horrible event. At 3 p.m. this afternoon, I spoke with President Aon of Lebanon to inform him that three large aircraft on the — are on the way, and they're uh, fully loaded — fully loaded — with medical supplies, food, water, and many other things, lots of emergency equipment. Also, first responders, technicians, doctors, and nurses are on their way. This was an event like the world has not seen for a long time. Horrible event. We'll be having a conference call on Sunday with President Macron, leaders of Lebanon, and leaders from various parts of the world. Everyone wants to help. We spoke to a lot of people. They all want to help. The United States is with authorities on the ground right now in Lebanon to identify further health and humanitarian needs, and we will provide further assistance in the period to come. We're working very closely with their government and with their leaders. And on behalf of the United States, I want to extend our condolences to all of the families, a much larger number of families than anybody would have thought and than anybody at first thought, but all of those families who lost loved ones, relatives, friends, in this horrible tragedy. We stand firmly with the people of Lebanon and will continue to offer our full support through this very difficult time. We have not seen anything like this in a long time. As you know, earlier this week, I met with American workers at the Tennessee Valley Authority who have been laid off by the leadership at the Tennessee Valley Authority. As you know, this is a form of utility. It's been around for a long time, since FDR. And the head person, not controlled by government, but it's sort of semi-public, in a sense, gets paid the highest salary in the world of government. Uh, it gets $8 million a year. That's not a bad amount of money. It's $8 million a year. And uh, we are not accepting that, even though we're not the ones that appoint him or her, but in this case, him. We're not accepting somebody getting paid $8 million a year. This has been going on for many years. And we will do something about that, and we're already in negotiations right now, including possible termination. They and hundreds of their fellow American tech workers, the workers at the TVA, were being terminated from their positions on top of all of this and on top of the $8 million salary and a chief of staff who makes much more than a million dollars a year. But on top of all that, they were being terminated from their positions, these incredible people, in order to train the lower-cost foreign workers imported to replace them. How's that for a law? And this was set up originally to create jobs and economic development. And now, they're getting fired, and they're supposed to train people for a much lower — who get a much lower salary. It's crazy. This was a grave injustice. I fired the chairman of the board in response. On Friday, I fired the chairman of the board, along with one other board member. That's the one thing we have. We have the right to fire board members. And I made it clear that if they did not swiftly reverse course, I would continue with these firings of the board members. And we just were informed that they have agreed to change course totally. And today, I'm proud to announce that a major victory for the workers of Tennessee and Kentucky and other areas that are covered — great states, great states that the leadership of the TVA has canceled all of the layoffs and given hundreds of American workers their jobs back. They're being rehired as we speak. In this administration, we live by two rules, buy American and hire American. You can't do that 
Can't fire all our workers and hire people back from other faraway parts of the world at lower prices, especially when they have to train the people. And they can never train them as good as what you have, because they've been there for many years. They've done a fantastic job. And they love the TVA. We had a lot of people in the office the other day. A lot of the media was covering it. They love the Tennessee Valley Authority. So uh, — and they're so proud to work for it. But this happened, and it was a terrible thing. So now they're going to get their jobs back. They're all going to be getting their jobs back. Nearly every nation on Earth continues to combat the virus. A number of countries are seeing a surge in new cases, including Japan, the Philippines, major parts of Europe. Cases continue to surge in Latin America. It's right now the most infected place anywhere in the world. They have more than doubled in recent days. Latin America is doing very little testing. They're not really equipped to do that. It's tough. In the United States, more than 80 percent of jurisdictions report declining cases. We're doing very well. You don't hear that too often from the media, but we're doing very well. We have a very large country, very complex country, in a sense. More than half of America's counties report fewer than 20 cases last week. So if you look at that, more than half of America's counties report fewer than 20 cases last week. But we have to remain vigilant. We're doing very well, but we have to remain vigilant. Nationally, the percentage of emergency room visits with the coronavirus symptoms is down to almost half what it was in July. The southern states that were very strong hotspots not long ago, Arizona, Texas, Florida, continue to show significant improvement, including increased availability of hospital beds. Arizona now has the smallest number of coronavirus inpatients since mid-June. It's gone. The governor was up, and uh, we had a, a great meeting, Governor Ducey, and the meeting was uh, terrific. But since mid-June, so they're doing well, and it's going down, heading down very rapidly, actually. Texas is stabilizing and improving rapidly with some progress in the Rio Grande Valley and other communities along the border with Mexico that had shown the biggest increases in hospitalizations and deaths. Florida is also stabilizing. Its statewide positive test rate continues to decrease from 13 percent on July 23rd to 8 percent this week. Florida has done very well. It's going down. It's heading down, actually, quite rapidly. And even Miami, which was the hottest spot in Florida, is heading downward. But Florida has done very well. Texas has done very well and rapidly. And Arizona has done incredibly well. So Arizona has really been a very rapid drop. New Jersey and New York remain stable, with less than 1 percent of emergency room visits due to the China virus. The illness uh, took a devastating toll on both states, as you know. While both states really took the brunt of the infection earlier this year, thankfully, we have not seen a resurgence. They've been doing a good job. Everybody's working very hard. Both governors are working very, very hard. We're in touch with them. We're supplying them with a lot of supplies as needed, if needed. But they're needing very little right now. They're in very good shape. We will continue to monitor the new cases. Throughout this crisis, my administration has provided extraordinary support of people, equipment, medical supplies to the people of New Jersey, to the people of New York, and to the people of every state, all of our states. We're carefully monitoring California's Central Valley as well as San Diego, Los Angeles, Sacramento, and San Francisco, which are starting to stabilize and go down. We're carefully watching regions from increasing cases, including Boston and Chicago, as well as the Midwest. We're watching them all very carefully. It's vital that all Americans work together to protect the vulnerable. For this reason, we've delivered vast amounts of protective equipment and testing supplies to nursing homes all across America. We're focused very much on the elderly, especially the elderly where they have heart problems or 
diabetes problems. Diabetes is a big problem. Approximately half of all deaths have occurred in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. It's an incredible number when you hear half of the deaths have been in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And I will tell you that I met with owners and representatives of nursing homes, and they are very, very vigilant. They're doing a very good job now. They've really done something that I think is special. They're doing very well in terms of uh, the virus. They're working very hard, and uh, a lot of things happened. A lot of forces came together and hit the nursing homes very hard. But the representatives of nursing homes, in some cases, the ownership of nursing homes, they're working very hard. The federal government and the private sector have delivered more than 9 million N95 masks, 27 million surgical masks, 3 million face shields, 20 million gowns, and 668 million gloves to New Jersey alone. Think of that. We provided $3.4 billion to the state of New Jersey in emergency relief funding. So we happen to be in New Jersey right now. So those are great numbers. The governor's working very hard. Governor Murphy's doing a good job. We're working very closely with him. We've also provided nearly $5 billion to New Jersey hospitals and healthcare facilities. And through the Paycheck Protection Program that you all know so well, we provided $23 billion to support more than 250,000 New Jersey small businesses. A lot of the small businesses that you see that are opening now and going to do well, they're there because of what we did with Paycheck Protection on therapeutics and vaccine updates three vaccine candidates have now moved into phase three trials this would be years ahead of schedule we have done wonders with the fda I want to thank the fda and all of the great people there and dr han but we have phase three trials already going on which is uh, most people would have said impossible to even think about today pfizer announced that it will manufacture Gilead's drug, Remdesivir, where we've had tremendous success. Last week alone, my administration procured and distributed over 120,000 vials of Remdesivir, enough to treat more than 19,000 patients. Plasma treatments continue to show incredibly encouraging results, really incredible what's going on. And if you can go to a blood bank, if you've had this disease and, and beat it, and there are a lot of people that have, if you could, go to a blood bank and donate. That would be a tremendous help. The United States is only 5 percent of the world's population, but we have conducted over 25 percent of the world's testing. Think of that, 5 percent, and we've given 25 percent of the world's testing. Any proper global analysis of confirmed cases must really take this into account because we're constantly showing cases, 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 cases are up. Well, the reason cases are up because we're doing one of the reasons. We're doing a lot of testing. We're doing much more testing than anyone else. Close to 65 million tests where other countries have done very little testing. Uh, they'll test people if they get sick. They'll test people if they go into the hospital. They'll test certain people. We're doing tremendous testing. And we're especially doing big testing at the nursing homes. Over the last week, the testing turnaround times have declined significantly as our major commercial labs have begun pooling samples. And we've also been able to send out many more of the tests, which are the five-minute to 15-minute result tests. Testing samples from multiple patients in one batch is also something that we're very focused on and doing. But uh, in the not-too-distant future, we'll have so many tests where it's a quick test. They call it a quick test, five minutes to 15 minutes. So we won't even have to worry too much about the process of sending and receiving. Because if you figure it takes a day to send and a day to receive, and let's say a day at the laboratory, that's three days right there. And the other tests, you can have them in five to 15 minutes. Over the next two weeks, I'll be pursuing a major executive order requiring health insurance companies to cover all pre-existing conditions for all customers. That's a big thing. I've always been very strongly in favor. We have to cover pre-existing conditions. So we will be pursuing a major executive order 
requiring health insurance companies to cover all pre-existing conditions for all of its customers. This has never been done before, but it's time the people of our country are properly represented and properly taken care of. This follows a series of executive orders to lower drug prices and lower prescription drug prices. And significantly, we had the only year, uh, which was last year, where drug prices went down in 51 years. But we're talking about going down at a level that nobody has even thought possible now even though the drug companies are running very big ads on me, but that's usually a reason. They're not too happy. They can't be too thrilled. But they've made a lot of money over the years, and uh, prices just go up. Not fair. This includes a landmark executive order requiring drug companies to change Americans and charge Americans no more than they charge to foreign countries. So they have to charge Americans no more than they charge to foreign countries. That means our country can't be charged more. So if Germany gets drugs at a very small or low price, and we're paying many times that price in the United States because we pay for all of the research, the development, the promotion, and other things, we will get what's called a favored nations clause we're going to have. And I signed a favored nations clause so that the United States, which is the number one purchaser of drugs by far in the world, biggest purchaser in the world, not even close. You have other countries that are bigger. If you look at India, China, etc., not too many. But we have countries that are bigger, but not even close in terms of ordering drugs. We're the number one country in the world. But we have a favorite nation. So if somebody has a, a drug, in many cases, it comes from a plant, the same plant. It comes from — it's the same pill. It's the same medicine or medication. Uh, whatever the lowest country charges. So if Germany charges 10 cents for a pill and we charge $2, and I only use Germany as an example, then we get that — we get that for 10 cents. So what's going to happen is that's going to go up a little bit, and ours is going to come down a whole lot. So it's uh, favored nations, and I will tell you that Big Pharma is not happy. For too long, we've been forced to subsidize cheaper drug prices in foreign countries. We've subsidized them to a level that nobody can believe. Nobody talked about it. Everybody wondered, how come every president that runs for office says they're going to lower drug prices? And they never do. They go through the right roof. Uh, over the last administration, they went up, like, skyrocketing skyrocketing. That's Biden. Biden's not going to be able to do it. He has no clue. So what's happening is uh, we are going to be working to get rid of all the subsidy to foreign lands, and we're going to give, essentially, all of the benefit that, frankly, they have as great negotiators. Those benefits are going to go to our people. So it's called a favored nation's clause, and uh, you can look it up, and you can see, and Nobody's had the courage to uh, institute it, to call it, because uh, it's a very big — it's a very big step. But it's something that is going to drive drug prices down 50, 60, maybe even 70 percent. Talking about numbers that are unbelievable. I also signed an executive order stopping middlemen from taking advantage of Medicare patients by charging higher prices to them and pocketing the discounts for themselves. These are some of the richest people in the world. Everyone talked about middlemen. I've heard about them for years on prescription drug prices. Middlemen. I guess you'd have to say, to be politically correct, middlemen and women. But you never heard the middle woman before. You heard middlemen. That's the term. And, you know, say what you want about the drug companies, but at least the drug companies produce a product. They produce the pill. They produce the medicine, the medication. But these people make billions and billions of dollars. I don't know who they are, but they're very rich. But they won't be so rich anymore. This executive order requires these $30 billion in discounts to go straight to the American patients. So the middleman's going to be knocked out. And I'm going to lose a lot of friends, even though I have no idea who these people are. <laughs> On opioids, I'm pleased to announce that my administration 
invested an additional $100 million to fight the opioid crisis in rural America. In the midst of the China virus pandemic, we also keep fighting to end the opioid epidemic, and we've done very well. We've done — it was prior to the virus, we were down 18, 19, and 20 percent. But when you think about it, that means that you have 80 percent, and that's not acceptable. The wall is going up. We have 276 miles of wall. It's having a tremendous impact on drugs coming into our country already. Uh, it'll be finished uh, toward the end of the year, and it's had a, a very, very big impact. On Portland, finally, I'd like to address that situation. Portland is a disaster. It's been a disaster for many, many years. Brave federal law enforcement officers single-handedly the officers, they single-handedly saved the federal courthouse in Portland from lawless rioters and agitators and anarchists. And that's what they are. You know, when you find Molotov cocktails in somebody's knapsack and they say, no, I'm just here to have a good time, uh, these are really sick, disturbed people. The disgraced mayor of the city has ordered the police to stand down in the face of rioters, leaving his citizens at the mercy of this mob. He was at the mercy of the mob, too. If you saw him go out there the other day, it was terrible. He went out there, and they wanted to rip him apart. But fortunately, he had five people with him called security. Mayor Wheeler has abdicated his duty and surrendered his city to the mob. As a result, the mob descended upon a police precinct and tried to burn it down, tear it down, rip it down. An act of attempted murder. Left-wing violent extremism poses an increasing threat to our country. And we stop it. We have no idea how much we stop. But it's an ideology we have to stop. When you commit arson — this is a quote from the mayor. He's come a long way. He just made this quote. When you commit arson with an accelerant in the attempt to burn down a building that is occupied by people who have intentionally been trapped inside, you're not a demonstrator or you're not demonstrating, said Mayor Whelan. You are attempting to commit murder. That's come a long way. He's come a long way when he made that statement. What you're seeing in Portland is the radical left's agenda in action. Portland is their roadmap for America. If the radical left gets in and they treat Joe Biden as a puppet, he's merely a puppet. But if the radical left gets in, they look at Portland as a thing that they want. That's what they want. Why? Who knows? Doesn't matter. It's a different thinking, but it's a mess. And I want to thank Homeland Security. They've done a fantastic job. We had our people go in. They stopped any intrusion into the courthouse. And uh, the courthouse was saved, and other federal buildings were saved. And we would like to be asked by the mayor and the governor. We will go in and stop the problems in Portland in 24 hours, just like we did in Minneapolis after they really hurt that city. But. The National Guard went in, did a phenomenal job. It was over in three hours. After watching six days of horror, it ended in three hours. You all saw the scene of them walking right down the street. Uh, just to, it was actually uh, an unfortunate view, but an incredible view of how to do things. So we would be able to solve the Portland situation immediately, but we are supposed to be asked. If we're not asked, and if it continues, we'll have to make a decision. But it's a very easy thing for us to do. We could stop it very quickly. It's been going on now for 76 days. But our buildings are very secure. If the Democrats controlled in Washington, the Democrats' control of Washington, they'd pass with all of the things they do, legislation gutting every single police department in America. They truly do. Many of these people want to defund the police department. At a minimum, they're going to stop money from going to the police department. But in many cases, they actually want to defund completely the police department. No city, no town, and no suburb would be safe. Your suburbs would be a disaster. Your cities, your towns would be a disaster. 
They want every city to be a Portland or to be a Chicago, which is totally out of control. And we're waiting for the mayor. We've sent people in to help them from an intelligence standpoint. But we're waiting for them to call the governor, the mayor. We could do a very good job in Chicago. Nobody's ever seen anything like that in this country. And yet, nationwide, numbers are good, despite the Chicago's and the Portland's and, frankly, the New York's, when you look at what's happened in New York. 348 uh, percent increase in the last number of months. Nobody's seen anything like that. It's so sad. To me, it's so sad, because I love New York. And it's so sad. And it, all it is is horrible, horrible, incompetent management by politicians that truly don't know what they're doing. So just like we saved the courthouse, we will save the United States of America. And a vast majority of people agree with me. A vast majority. Most people. They don't speak up as much as they could, but we know they're there, and everybody else knows they're there, too. So with that, I'll take a few questions from the media. They've been here for a long time, and they've been waiting outside for a long time, and they wait for these moments. It's always a lot of fun. Please, go ahead. No, you. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. I have a couple of questions on the negotiations with Capitol Hill on the yeah. coronavirus legislation. These executive orders you mentioned, do you have a timeline on when you're going to sign them? Or yeah, it could be by uh, the end of the week. They're being drawn by the lawyers right now. They work very nicely. Uh, it would be nice to be able to do it with the Democrats, but they're really just interested in one thing, and that's protecting people that have not done a good job in managing cities and states, and nothing to do with COVID, nothing to do with — or little to do. They want to be able to make up for many, many years, in some cases, decades of bad management. We can't do that. So that's what they want. They want to do that, and we don't want to do that. Are you concerned that about the legality of these executive orders? No, not at all. No, if somebody — well, you always get sued. I mean, everything you do, you get sued. I was sued on the travel ban. And we won. I was sued on a lot of things, and we won. So we'll see. Yeah, probably we get sued, but uh, people feel that we can do it. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. President, the intelligence agencies today said that Russia is already meddling in this year's election to hurt Joe Biden, and that China is considering meddling to hurt you. Do you believe that intelligence, and what do you plan to do about it? It could be. I mean, I could be very much. I think that the last person Russia wants to see in office is Donald Trump, because Nobody's been tougher on Russia than I have ever. That's not uh, well, I don't care what anybody says. Nobody, nobody with any common sense would say, do it. Look at what we've done with our military. Look at what we've done in exposing the pipeline with billions of dollars going to Russia. Look at all of the things we've done with NATO, where I've raised $130 billion a year from countries that were delinquent, and now they're paying all of this money. And the 130, by the way, $130 billion, not million, billion, goes to $400 billion over a few years. And that's all uh, money to protect against Russia. Uh, China would love us to have an election where Donald Trump lost to sleepy Joe Biden. They would dream. They would own our country. If Joe Biden was president, China would own our country. And you said another country? What was the third country? No, just those two. No, no, you didn't, you didn't say then the report. The report said Iran also. But you didn't say that. Didn't Iran would love to see me. <laughs> Iran would love to see me not be president. And I'll, I'll make this statement: uh, If and when we win, we will make deals with Iran very quickly. We'll make deals with North Korea very quickly. And whatever happened to the war in North Korea, you haven't seen that, have you? If I didn't win the election in 2016, our country would now be maybe it would be over by now, but in war with North Korea. Everybody said, oh, Trump will get us in war. No, just the opposite. And we actually have a relationship with North Korea, which is something that was never established by the previous administration. You would have been in war with North Korea, and it would have been a very bad war. So North Korea, whether you look at Iran, every one of them will make a deal with us very quickly. Iran is dying to make a deal, but they want to see, because they'd much rather make a deal with Biden because if they make a deal with the United States, if China makes a deal with the United States with Biden in charge, they would own our country. Look what I've done. I've taken billions, tens of billions of dollars from China. China was having the worst year they've had in 67 years, and we were having the best year we've ever had with big tax cuts, with big regulation cuts. We've rebuilt our military. 
We became uh, independent in terms of energy. We're the energy leader of the world. Uh, we were having the best year we've ever had. By the way, African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American unemployment numbers, the best in the history of our country. All things, and many other groups too, including women, including high school diploma, no high school diploma, college diploma. Everybody was doing better. The last thing that Russia wants, and China wants, and Iran wants, would be for Donald Trump to win. Yes, just, please. Just to follow up, what do you plan to do about that interference, sir? Uh, well, we're going to look at it very closely. You tell me that this came out a little while ago, and I've heard that it came out. It came out just a little while ago, and we're going to look at that very closely. But you started off with Russia. Russia. Why don't you start off with China? Do you think China's maybe a bigger threat? I mean, I think maybe it is. I mean, you'll have to figure it out. But we're going to watch all of them. We have to be very careful. The biggest risk that we have is mail-in ballots, because with the mail-in ballots, called universal mail-in ballots, it's much, it, it is a much easier thing for a foreign power, whether it's Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, many others, people, countries you wouldn't expect, it's much easier for them to forge ballots and send them in. It's much easier for them to cheat with universal mail-in ballots. So I think one of the things we'll have to look at is exactly that. But that's a big problem. That's a big problem. You saw in New York, they called the winner, but they have no idea what the vote is. Please, go ahead. Mr. President, we've watched these negotiations go on for weeks. Do you think if you had been more directly involved, we would be in a different position? No, I'm here? totally involved. No, I, they call me all the time. They tell me how they're doing with Nancy and Chuck. Uh, but in my opinion, they're just using it as an excuse to try and, you know, Chuck Schumer came out with a strong statement today that you have to get back into school because it's good for the economy. But he, has, he doesn't do it. He doesn't practice what he preaches. No, my people, Steve Mnuchin, and our wonderful chief of staff, Mark Meadows, they're constantly on the phone with me. I'm totally involved with it. And we are going to do it in a way that's just much easier. We gave them their chance, but they view it as an election uh, enhancement. You know, you talk about foreign countries cheating on the election. Well, the Democrats are cheating on the election because that's exactly what they're doing. If you look at what they're doing, even with these negotiations, that's an influence and an unfair influence on an election. But we're going to win anyway. Yeah, please President, go ahead. When was the last time you spoke to Speaker Pelosi, though? We're at this historic moment. Why haven't you spoken well, to her? Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But right now, they're not ready. And they're not ready because, frankly, I don't think they care about People, I think they care about their politicians that have done a terrible job running the cities and states, Democrat cities and states, that are bleeding money, that have been so badly run. You take a look at Baltimore, and you take a look at so many different cities, including the ones I've already mentioned. Uh, take a look at what's going on. And they want lots of money to keep, keep it going. For many years, they've been bad. So all I'm doing is we're having it out. We're finally having it out. Yeah, please. Mr. President, if you uh, go ahead on your own on uh, unemployment insurance, uh, I'm wondering both where you're going to get the money to pay for that without Congress, and will people still get $600 yeah, a week? Yeah, we have the money. We have the money. They'll still get $600 yeah. a week? Uh, yeah, I won't say that yet. You'll see that when it happens, but we have the money. Will you say what number? We have it, Justin. We have plenty of money. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. You said that the pandemic is disappearing, but we lost six thousand Americans this week and just in this room you have dozens of people who are not following the guidelines in New Jersey which say you should not have more no, they don't have a political activity you say, you say you're, you're wrong on that because it's a political activity they have exceptions political activity and it's also a peaceful protest so when you have and, and as you know they asked if they could be you know, they, a number of, uh, and to me, they look like they all have, pretty much all have masks on. But, uh, you know, you have an exclusion in the law. It says peaceful protest or political activity, right? In fact, specifically, yeah, it says exactly political activity or peaceful protest. And you can call it political activity, but I, I'd call it peaceful protest because they heard you were coming up, and they know the news is fake. They understand it better than anybody. And they asked whether or not they asked whether or not they can be here. Like the question about Russia, he doesn't mention Iran was in the report. He doesn't mention, or he mentions very late, that China was in the report. Because that's the way they are. They're not — if the press in this country 
were honest, it wasn't corrupt, if it wasn't fake, our country would be so much further ahead. But we're doing really great. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much.